Hello, everyone, and welcome to the LSC for today's hybrid event titled Can People Change the World? Activists, Social Movements, and Utopian Futures. This forms a part of LSC's festival titled People and Change. My name is Armina Ishkanian, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Social Policy at the LSC, and I'm also the executive director of the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Program based at the LSE's International Inequalities Institute. I was meant to be a speaker, but we had an unforeseen event, so um, I've stepped in as chair. I'm very pleased to be here to welcome Dr. Faiza Shaheen, who's with us in person, and Georgia Haddad Nicolau, who is online, joining us from Brazil. Welcome to both our in-person audience and to everyone joining us online. Dr. Faiza Shaheen is the program head for the Inequality and Exclusion Grand Challenge of the Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just, and Inclusive Societies at the Center for on International Cooperation at New York University. She is also an economist, commentator, and the author of a recently published book, Know Your Place which you can purchase straight after this event. Georgia Haddad Nicolau is an Atlantic Fellow for Social and Economic Equity and a co-founder and director of, Braz of the Brazilian Commons-based organization Instituto Procomum. She is a civil society professional, activist, cultural manager, and creative professional. Hi, Georgia. Good to see you. Hi. For any Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Festival, all one word. I would please ask everyone in the audience to put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event. This event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. As usual, there will be an opportunity for you to put your questions to our speakers. For our online audience, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature. Please include your name and affiliation as you do so. And for those attending in person, I will let you know when we will open the floor for questions. Kindly raise your hand and I will let you know, um, I, I will ask the stewards to bring you a roving microphone. And again, please let us know your name and affiliation. I will try to ensure a range of questions from both our online and in-person audiences. So the way this is going to work is instead of having two presentations, I'm going to ask four questions and the uh, speakers will respond in turn. And they will have, after each round of questions, an opportunity to comment um, on each other's questions. After about half an hour, I'll open the floor to Q&A. So shall we get started? Yeah. Great. So Georgia, you're going to be um, the first. Um, so the first question is, the 21st century has seen the world shaken by protests. Why do you think we are seeing so many protests all around the globe? And to what extent is the mobilization by, so by social movements affecting wider policy and political changes? Over to you, Georgia. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Do you hear me well? Yes. Yeah? OK. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. And nice to meet you, Fraser, and everybody else. So I'm Georgia. I'm speaking from Brazil. It's 7 AM here, so good morning. <laughs> um, so uh, and I love this uh, subject of the, the session, because it's something that um, I think about every day, but not as a question, but as an affirmation that people can change the world. Uh, um, and regarding your question, Armin, I think that one of the reasons that we have seen the world uh, rising is, is because of democracy, because I think we have space to protest, um, maybe not the space we need and want, but with space and connectedness. So we have more people um, connected to each other from different localities, uh, more access to information. So from one side, I do think that we have, um, think of uh, about like 100 years ago, 
we have more space to protest. We have more um, space to say what we want and see wrong. And at the same time, we have more inequality also. So I think the access to tools, information, to connection with other collectives, um, and your, our interdependence, and on the other hand, the fact that inequality is raising, and some people just don't have any other option rather than just go to the streets and organize themselves in order to um, live to see me, right? Um, and we know that it's not always effective in the sense that we have seen the state um, using their forces against protests, but also um, I still think that if we look at as a historical uh, timeline, uh, we're seeing changes, seeing things that we would never imagine. So I think I do think that mobilization by social movements is affecting policy and political changes, not always for the good. So this year is 10 years of 2013 in Brazil when we had the protests um, and then that, not directly, but three years later, a president got scooped or impeached, depends on how you read it. For me, she got impeached. Um, and it did affect political changes because we also seen Bolsonaro rise. But then now we see Lula coming back and, you know, I think Brazil is still trying to understand the effects of 2013. So I think there are changes. We just don't know that exactly where they led us, but um, I think it totally connected to both the right in power, but also the reorganizing of social movements again. At least this is what I'm seeing in Brazil. Thank you, Georgia. Over to you, Raisa. Yeah, so I think the first thing to note really is to the scale of which protest has increased around the world. Um, there was a study that looked at a 15-year period, 2006 to 2020, and it found that, um, that protests had um, doubled, tripled in 15 years. And then when we did some work at NYU looking at data between 2020 and 2022, we saw a 44% increase again. And this is, you know, it's really something that people are out in the street in this way, and it's increased in every region, which, of course, we know that some regions are, uh, and some countries are not as open to having... Um, civil society, but you can see that anger spill out onto the streets wherever you look. Now, understanding why that is, um, I think there are multiple factors, and there's some good studies that have looked at this. You know, some of this is just a failure, just anger at failed political systems and the lack of democracy. Some of this is about inequality. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that at the same time we've had this high level of inequality and people recognize that they can see that the rich are getting a lot richer while their lives have got a lot harder, um, they are then faced with this situation where actually policy is moving in the other direction. So if you take a look at some of the protests that happened in, say, Colombia in, in 2021, 2020, what, yeah, 2021, you know, this anger at, like, what was happening to taxes, to taxes on um, working class and middle class people when actually the tax increase should be on the wealthiest. Um, and so I think that disconnect between this growing chasm in um, people's well-being and livelihoods with this kind of opposite direction of policy often, the way in which um, uh, states have been captured and policies are moving in the opposite direction to which people would hope. Um, I think it's really important to note that of these protests, you know, those of us that I mean, worked in civil society, of course, we love to see protests because we think people should go out and fight for their rights. But some of these protests are not necessarily um, about, you know, all of the struggles we might care about in this room. They are, at, like, anti-masks, um, you know, they're kind of vac anti-vaccine. There are things that maybe, you know, we might not necessarily think that um, would be the case a few years ago. But they still demonstrate a lack of trust 
And that's the key here. It's a lack of trust in institutions. And we've seen this fundamental um, shift down in how much people trust institutions, partly because of the policy disconnect that I've spoken about. But more in general, you know, just seeing that um, the political actors are not representing the interests of people and not feeling heard. Thanks, Faiza. It's interesting, you both mentioned democracy, but in different ways. Um, failure of democracy or democracy as opening up space. Um, so on that, you know, when we talk about democracy or political systems, I'm going to my second question, which is about where do we think change happens, right? The locus of change. And what is the relationship between institutionalized politics, so parliamentary politics, um, governments, and social movements? And, and as you're thinking about this, when we think about the state, we often think about national or federal levels. Are there differences between you know, the ability of change to happen at a local versus a national level? So this time I'll start with you, Faiza, about the relationship of institutionalized politics and change. So some of you will know, but um, so I'm running for the Labour Party at the next election against Ian Duncan Smith. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I've kind of been thinking about this a lot, and a lot of people ask me about this. You know, what is it, what, couldn't you make more difference outside of Parliament? Like, what's, you know, what is the actual balance of action and change that can happen? And there's a lot of discontent around our institutions. Our institutions have been too slow, our politicians um, and political systems have, at best, been incrementalist, at best. Um, and, you know, the frustration is, is that we need to have bold change. We need to see um, uh, things happen quickly. Um, and so this is where I think social movements become more and more important. And, and, you know, this is my answer to people that ask me this. You know, it just happened to be that my life has moved in this direction. But 100%, we need to have strong social movements and outside pressure in this moment. Um, so, you know, whether that's trade unions and strikes, whether that's um, people taking to the streets and demanding action, there needs to be that pressure. And let me tell you, um, I've literally just been selected as a candidate. We don't know when the next general election will be. I've already started receiving emails from private companies trying to lobby me. And this is, you know, and that's me, right? And I'm on the left, and you wouldn't expect that they would necessarily target me. But that goes to show just how much our institutions are being captured by these interests and, and being constantly lobbied. So we need to make sure that we have the balance, uh, uh, um, and not the balance, really like much more of a voice of people's interests. And so social movements are really, really important in understanding that change. And I really don't think that change will come from parliament. It will come from outside and outside pressure on parliament to take action. And I, I think that's true here, and I think that's true in lots of countries that I've seen and worked in. Thanks, Faiza. Georgia. Uh, yeah, first of all, good to hear that, Faiza. I'm always really empathic and feeling a lot of proud of everybody that goes uh, to institutional politics. And I think that we need, we need um, people willing to do that. Um, I myself served for the government um, some years during Juma's um, one and first and second term, at least uh, half of the second term. Um, but uh, I totally agree with Faiza. I think that you know um, it's easier maybe to see the consequences of you know um, change uh, in the more local context. But I think it's really important that we have this connection between the local and the national in terms of that um, everything is interdependent. And I think that um, we at Procomun, we defend a lot that we need communities networked. So we really need to, you know, have a lot of communities that are working with other communities and in this friction between communities in that uh, network that, you know, are learning from, you know, their own experiences and co-producing politics is what, where change comes. And I think that institutional diversity, thinking about civil society, we need different forms of organization, experimental forms of organization that people actually practice, experiment, use their creativity in order to think also ways of governance, you know, of how do we uh, create change among ourselves as well, because I think that there's an idealization that, you know, 
oh, at least, you know, we, we tend to think that either the state or the market is going to solve the problems. At least this is how uh, in some countries that have been, we've been created to see, you know, the state as this big papa or big mama to, that will solve and we are only users or clients. But we know also that for a long time now, uh, or maybe never, um, the state was for the people, right? I mean, at least if you think about the, the formation of the nation state in Brazil, you know, it, it, it's, an, it's a nation that is based on slavery. Uh, and the fact that, you know, once you, you abolish slavery in Brazil, you didn't create any possibility of economic inclusion or dignity of life or, or access to land uh, for the people that were brought from Africa. Um, you, you know that already the that it's not a democracy and it's not a state for everybody. It hasn't been since then, right? So uh, we like to think that, you know, it's not that we want to go back to any other thing, but we want to create other forms of representation. Um, and I think that people like Faiza or people like, uh, like Marielle Franco who was murdered, you know, during Bolsonaro's term, uh, but it was a black, uh, uh, city council that was really important to us. They are really important. And of course she paid with her own life, but she's being honored by a lot of other black women that are now in institutional politics, but alone they cannot change anything. And I think that is really important. And now that Lula is back on power, uh, we've been saying that a lot from, from the civil society perspective that we have to be critical. We have to be in dialogue. We have to be cooperating, but at the same time, we also have to be occupying our space without having to say, you know, excuse me, because there is no other way um, of creating change rather than, you know, strengthening civil society, strengthening our forms of organization, diversifying our forms of organization that they can be sustainable, you know, um, in, in during um the extreme right, then center left. I mean, things changes, right? We've seen how, how fast they can change in Brazil. You know, we, we thought we were going one direction and then suddenly we saw ours in its nightmare. Uh, and the nightmare is still here, as Faisal was saying, you know, extreme right is still there. So my, my, my thinking is that we have to keep on going, making alliances, you know, um, and, also, Thanks, always looking from the civil society to the state. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you. I know th there's so much in what you were saying, and I think, you know, the key points here about, di you know, the, the different um, kind of politics and co-production, and, and I think, you know, this is something we need to be thinking about, that everyone who is on the streets isn't um, mobilizing for the same um, issues. And given, and this is my third question, Given the current fragmented and polarized nature of our politics today in many parts of the world, where, you know, is civil society a space where dialogue can occur or, you know, is it a site of conflict? What role, what function does civil society play in this, you know, high level of polarization? And I think Brazil is particularly an apt example of this. So, Georgia, over to you. Yeah, um, I think that we've seen, you know, protests from civil society from the extreme right in Brazil, especially after 2013, they take, they took the streets. But if you follow the money, um, you know that it's not, you know, social movements or like people uh, only by the agency, but it's also a lot of, you know, private money being invested. Uh, a lot of private money being invested, you know, uh, extreme right philanthropy is real and is rising. Um, and also, you know, evangelic church, they have a lot of power. So I think it's really important, you know, to think about the complexity of, you know, the layers of polarization, uh, giving, you know, um, oligopolies of social media and also, you know, the alliance between, you know, the agents of disinformation, with extreme right and how they managed to be so successful um, in in uh, accessing all these tools and really managing them in a form that we have never seen before. And I think now progressives and left are now running um, to see, you know, what happened and how, you know, how can we use these 
Um, but I think like at this, at the other hand, I think civil society can play a big role um, in creating dialogue. So I think one thing that we've seen, for example, with our care economy project is that when you speak about care, for example, you know, caring for caring for life, caring for the people, caring for the, the children, caring for the elderly. This is something that is not left or, or, or right, you know. Uh, most of women suffer by, you know, uh, triple journeys, you know, reproductive work. And you can be evangelic and vote for Bolsonaro, or you can be a leftist in our urban center, but you're still struggling, you know. So what we are seeing here is that, you know, um, instead of like tribalizing politics or saying, oh, this is how oh, I'm Lula or I'm Bolsonaro, can we speak about, you know, dignity, agendas of life, you know, in practice, you know, in practice from the communities, with the communities, you know, from the ground. So I think this is where uh, we can actually um, forget about polarization. And at least from my experience, this is where we're having a, a bit of success. Nice. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up actually on, on a point as well that I didn't answer in the last question about the kind of local yeah. dynamics of this. I was just on the tube coming here from my house, which is in the constituency that I'm running in, and some guys, I was like putting on my highlighter, <laughs> and some guy stopped me and was like, oh, you're running in. You know, I do think there's something really important about the fact that um, you've got to target your local political actors, and, you know, I, I mean, a lot of our current MP, for instance, doesn't live in the area, but... MPs can live in and around the area. And actually, anywhere where there's political actors, it's really important mm. that civil society tries to go straight to them. Um, and um, I think holding our political actors account at that very local level, even on the tube when they're putting on their eyeliner, is, you know, is, is, a, is a good thing and something we should think about. And it's part of the kind of experimentation of local democracy as well. Um, on this point about kind of polarized worlds, the work we do, we've been doing at NYU, so we work with a number of governments around the world and we look at what policies they can put in place to address inequality and exclusion. And it started off as quite a technical project, to be honest, to looking at um, different things they'd put in place. And then it, I expanded a bit to look at how they were com communicating some of these things. And then something really dramatic happened um, really over the last 18 months or so is that we kept losing governments. So... South Korea had to pull out of the project because they had um, a change of government, in part because there was a backlash. A gen it was around gender. What had happened was that there was um, a divisive narratives that basically said all these girls are taking your job because of gender equality, and young men, dramatic, there was a dramatic difference in how young men and young women voted in that election. Young men voted to the, to the right because they blamed women for that. In Costa Rica, we lost the government we were working with because... Um, they had managed to get through gay marriage. They'd done a lot of other good things, but they'd got through gay marriage, and what had happened is that then a narrative started that they're only for the gays. They don't care about working-class people. They don't care about... And again, we saw it in Sweden as well. We lost our government in Sweden. Um, and that was partly because of a very strong Islamophobia and anti-immigration um, push um, by the right. And so, you know, when we talk about polarized societies, what we're seeing is this very strong push on divisive narratives. And we held a workshop in Spain with the um, Spanish Equ Ministry of Equality last year. And it was amazing to us how many countries wanted to come, wanted to share their experiences, how much they're struggling, how much similarity there were in tactics. So yes, it's about where the money, the, the point about Georgia made about the money, but it's also about online tactics. Um, there's clearly a global sharing of how to divide our societies that is, is happening. And the reverse, I don't think, has happened to the same extent. We're just not as organized. Um, and I think, you know, the role of civil society when we have these political pressures, you know, often um, here included is that when these divisive narratives happen, even leaders, you know, supposedly on the left or centre-left, they don't really have an answer. They don't really have narratives that bring communities together. Um, and so in that situation, yes, civil society is really important for creating dialogue. It's really important for bringing people together. It's really important for putting alternative visions of society that do talk about the connections that we have with each other, regardless of gender or race mm. or disability or whatever it may look like. Um, and that is really, really fundamental. And it's 
it's really um, it's really at the core of why we're not getting the change that we want to see and why we're seeing this kind of seesaw from the left to the very right um, in, in political systems around the world. Thanks, Faiza. I think it's really interesting, that point about, you know, this funding, because actually, I mean, one of the critiques from the right to the left is that, oh, you know, it's all funded by Soros, and that's a global discourse. You know, I've heard it in the United States. I mean, many places I've done research. United States, you've heard it in Russia, in Armenia, in Turkey. You hear that, Greece. So, you know, but no one really knows about the right-wing philanthropy that you're talking about, Georgia. And I think, you know, that there is this assumption that it's, you know, particular actors that are fueling um, these dynamics. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time, and I want to in, in bring in our audience, but I have one last question, and I would prefer to end on a hopeful note. Um, so, you know, we've talked about the challenges, we've talked about, you know, the, the polarization and, and where change happens, um, you know, the dynamics between street politics and, and institutionalized politics. How do you imagine a better world? Or what does a utopia look to you? You know, because this is, this is what our um, topic is. It's looking at also the future, thinking about utopian futures. So, Faiza, I have you down as um, answering that first. That's a big question. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things. I could list lots of things. But I think, for me, the last few years, and I, I trained as an economist, so I kind of looked at things more from that perspective for a long time. But I think there's some... For me, utopia is about a reset in our relationships with each other and our respect and dignity in society. So the, the book, um, Know Your Place, is all about this idea of um, social mobility and making it in the world and setting up this idea of making it as being so narrow and often jobs that are not that helpful for society that don't really offer a lot of value um, to the rest of us. And, for me, if I'm ch when I was trying to understand for all these years, like why are we not seeing the change given where the economics is going, given where the, the trends in inequality are going, um, that relationship, that ability to dehumanize some because they didn't work hard enough or on the basis of their identity is key. So for me, it's key to why we're not seeing change. So for me, the kind of utopia, the switch, for me is about um, what we do to make sure that um, there's no... Um, we kind of checked our snobbery that mm. we're not kind of judging people because they're truck drivers or bus drivers or you know really important jobs in society like care workers they are um, paid well they are respected we understand that as a society we need each other you know we had that moment during covid um, when we recognized that the essential workers you know a large proportion of essential workers are on low pay still on low pay um, and that that switch i think would help bring the kind of empathy that we need to change policy as well, because the current system, our current system of the rat race, of this very strong sense of hierarchy in society, um, that is not going to bring about any kind of utopia. Thank you. That's really powerful. Georgia, last word to you before I open it up to the audience. Yeah, um, so um, because during my time at Atlantic Fellowship, uh, I wrote a a booklet about um, commons now, um, Latin American spells for collective uh, action. And I think that um, uh, my work really gives me hope because every day, every day I meet people that are building a better life for all, um, not just for themselves. And I think that there are way, way more people that are building uh, a better world than the ones that are destroying. It's just that the, dis the destroying ones maybe are louder or, you know, more powerful sometimes. Uh, but um, what I defend in commons now is that the world we want to see is happening right now yeah. in many places, many, many places. Uh, every day people build solutions for communitary life and people wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for that. Because, you know, people live in really, really bad conditions, right? And I'm not saying that to say, oh, uh, that, let's keep it the way it is. But I think that there's no, like, oh, one day we're going to get there. It's like every day is a practice. Every day we should be expanding our possibility of, you know, uh, doing together um, and expanding the horizons of where change is happening and from whom this change is coming. So I'm really hopeful. 
<laughs> Georgia, I love thank talking you. to you because you, you <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you so much, Georgia and, and Faiza. Um, and I should say, Georgia, we have copies of your booklet, so um, we will be handing them out after the event. I know you're not here. <laughs> but, <laughs> Great, so um, thank you so much for the insightful discussion. I'm now going to open the floor to questions. The way I'll do it is I will take one online and one in person each round. Um, so I'm going to look at, where's Saga? Um, there you are, Saga. So uh, Saga, I will take one question from you and then I have, okay. Uh, Saga. Yeah. Great. Um, so the first question, um, I don't have a name for it. Oh, it's um, Banu Deer um, who asked the question. And it is, during the referendum campaign, the Brexit lobby was much better at disseminating information and targeting voters. The Remain campaign was disordered and did not reach undecided voters well. How can we learn from this experience to counter the far right? Uh, what can individuals do to resist the far right propaganda? Okay. I'll let you think about that while I take <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Calvin. I represent the interests of European Guanti, which is a non-profit um, organization dealing with European-China relations. So my question is a bit more focused on the economic side. Um, obviously, there's this notion that the private is very profit-maximizing and the public is bureauc bureaucratic and slow. But Georgia, I'm thinking about it in the context of PICS, the digital public infrastructure payment system that Brazil has, um, and then the crux of the question is to better understand to what extent you feel like a public-private partnership is necessary to be able to instill social movements and change. Okay, thank you. Um, would you like to go first, Faiza? Yeah, I mean, um, I, think, I think the thing on Brexit, it wasn't just that Remain was not good at targeting voters, it just had a really weak message. Um, it was about scaring people that the economy is going down and it didn't have any heart in it. It had no, it had no sense of who we want to be as a country. Um, and whereas the argument from the Brexit campaign was about, did get into values, it did get into, it tapped into an emotion. Um, and I think sometimes too often the kind of ta technocrats working in policy um, and policy making and, and ca political campaigns um, do go into technical messages and actually are often quite disconnected from people. And um, that's true, like, and I talk about it in the book, about how many spaces I've been in are such elite spaces, a complete disconnect, whereas actually the Brexit campaign had done its homework, it had gone out and spoken to people. And so, you know, I think that's the thing to learn from is the grassroots connection, is actually understanding where people are at. Like, so there's this really great example of how um, there was like a debate somewhere in the country and, and one of the Remainers said, you know, started talking about GDP and someone in the audience shouted out, that's your GDP. And, you know, it just hadn't occurred to them that this is A, kind of a technical argument and B, like, it doesn't mean anything to people when they've already felt like economically worse off to be told that this is going to make you worse off because things are already bad. Um, so I think it was just, you know, wrong from, like, start to, to end. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned about lack of um, uh, emotional communication and values-based communication in that campaign. Thank you. And Georgia, you had a question about public-private partnerships. and Yeah. Can I just also, uh, just to add on what Faiza is saying, I don't know the, con the full context of Brexit, but I can also say... Just to add to what Faisal already said in terms of narrative change and, um, you know, the feeling of, you know, being with people, but also the far right here uh, committed a lot of crimes, like really a lot of crimes in terms of uh, fake news dissemination. Mm -hmm. So I think that we also have to look from this point of view that, you know, the ethics is not there at all. Um, but there are um, like a fine line that I think the left can learn a bit, and I think there are some organizations here in Brazil trying to uh, engage that and spread this to wider movements of, you know, how to use it. Um, and at the same time, I do think that as an individual, uh, you know, you ask how to do that, I think, you know, really engage with, with other people, you know, with uh, communities. Um, and regarding the, the question whether, like, private um, 
private um, civil society relationship, right? Like alliance. Um, I think that is super necessary. Uh, and uh, I think that we, we have seen some uh, good experiences of this alliance between, you know, private sector and, and social movements. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it, to some extent, you know, you can't really change unless you actually, you know, create this alliance. The point is, uh, um, how do we enter in this kind of, you know, cooperation and, and build alliances um, from a point of view that you, you, how do we address power imbalance in this relationship? That's what I mean. And I think at least in Brazil, we have seen um, some, um, I don't know, especially after Bolsonaro, some people woke up, you know, some people from the private sector woke up on, like their own responsibility, but not by themselves, right? So you, you, you see like, um, uh, there's some NGOs that are really, you know, um, and social movements that are really, you know, um, paying attention um, and, 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 you know, going and speaking with the private sector and calling them out for their responsibility. So I, I think it, it, it's important and as it is, you know, dialogue, because I think um, the far right is, is really, really well organized and well funded. Um, and, and I think... Um, we need, we need to, to, to find our center again. Right now, there's no center in Brazil. Center is gone. I think you can say that for many places. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I will take another question online, and then I had, yeah? Okay. Um, yes, so a question from uh, Faradhan Gaiha, from a prospe prospective student from Mumbai. India, and the question is um, about the um, um, follow the money uh, and the funding um, discussions that you've already had, and it's related to how can individuals be um, uh, to get more info, how can individuals get more information and be more aware of the funding and the financials behind um, politics and social movements. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, my question is more on institutions and how you see local, national, and international institutions um, accounting for the fact that there may not be one utopia and that what is a utopia might be very different depending yeah. on who you are and where you are. Thank you. Um, just mindful of time and how many hands I've seen. I'm going to take one more question. Um, right there in the middle. Can, can you? Yeah. I thank you uh, for the talk, it's been super interesting. I was um, wanting to go back to Faisal's comment around this disconnect between the left sometimes, which I've seen in Italy as well, uh, and uh, grassroots movements. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on why that has happened and what we can do to rebuild that connection. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let the um, speakers go, and then I've got one, two, three, four, five people on my list in the room. I don't know how many are online. No more? Okay, so the next ones will be. So um, last time I started with Faiza, um, Georgia, would you like to start us off? Yeah, can it just remind me, like, generally? <laughs> I think I lost some of the questions. Um, I think maybe you can address the question about, you know, the utopias, that there isn't one utopia. Maybe that's... Yeah, I'll, I'll try to address, and if I if I not answer, um, let me know. Um, so just um, one that I, I wrote down is the follow the money. Um, I, I want just to highlight the next um, partners of ours here in Brazil. They actually got, got inspired by a U.S. Um, collective, but the Sleeping Giants Brazil, they are really big, um, and they're too. Uh, they were they were too young, you know, twenty. Um, 20 years old, uh, she, he was an Uber driver and she was selling makeup uh, in the countryside of the south of Brazil. And during the pandemic, they decided to create a Twitter on Sleeping Giants. Uh, and they're, they've been really important to follow the money uh, and see you know, who is um, funding extreme right-wing um, propaganda. 
So I think it's a, a, a beautiful case of, you know, activism with, you know, internet, online, etc. And um, there's some online thing about them, Sleeping Giants Brazil. So I think, you know, it's a really, and we, we incubated them and also we, we hit them during, because they were anonymous and they were being pursued. We hit them um, in our lab. So we have a really nice experience with a uh, story with them. Um, and I think regarding utopia, I would, my experience is, is totally connected to the third question about this connection of the left. There is no, no such thing as one big narrative. And I think this has to end. I think this is where it led us to the, where we are now. You know, there's no such thing as let's take capitalism out and put something back, you know, as this big, you know, I know it's important to have big narratives and, and you know, etc. But my invitation is like, how can we uh, take the road back to mm. diversity of experiences? People are so different. Even if you like have, you know, two black women from, you know, at the same like, economic level, they're gonna be totally different on what they consider uh, what uh, utopia, what they consider, you know, possibilities of life. So I think it's really important for us to learn how to, you know, value, um, diversity from a different perspective. So we like to say in Procomum is that, you know, a, a, a word between the difference is not only possible, but necessary. So how can we, from our differences, build many words, you know, um, that that fit in this world? You know, and I think in the, in the booklet that I wrote, I, I tell some of these stories of many words that fit in this world. And this is where I, I, I like to see. There's no such a, I, I, of course, there's not a pragmatic answer, but I, it's just because I think the answer is not a given and will be not given. You know, it is on the way, you know, with our creativity, with our bonds, you know, experimenting that we also will uh, th through the way. Thanks, Georgia. Aiza? Yeah, a few things. I mean, I just um, just to emphasize that we need more work on following the money. It takes a lot of time and effort to look into this, and it puts people in danger, as Georgia was saying. So if there's any funders in the crowd, we should be looking to fund people to look at this in some depth. Um, because I, I know that there's work happening by a few groups, Progressives International in the US, and a few places to try and look into this. But it does take time, and to do the work properly and make sure that you're not going to get into any legal problems. Yeah which they will try and hit you with, you know, mm -hmm. but it does take some um, real effort and time, which needs to be funded. Um, I think in terms of the like local national institution utopia, a, a couple of things on that. Um, one is actually, I just want to emphasize that the international has become so important because um, so many of global problems right now are that, they're global, they're not actually born of just national issues. So of course, the cost of living crisis, right? So Russia invades Ukraine, that has all these reverberations for the rest of the world. Um, you know, of course the climate, but in general, there's so many po there's so many issues that are coming, that are spilling over borders. And so the international actors have become really important, yet our multilateral system is completely not fit for purpose. Yeah. Um, I've been, the last couple of years spent a lot of time at the UN and World Bank and the IMF looking at just, you know, failure after failure, essentially. So um, it's important to kind of recognize that, that connection and the role that social movements need to play globally and connecting up to make sure that we do have debt cancellation again, for instance, and we do um, re push to reform finally the World Bank and the IMF, who are at core to actually some of these protests in the world as well, you know, bread riots because of inflation going up and the IMF not supporting in terms of um, debt restructuring. Um, I think one, I would, this might seem a bit contradictory, like I completely agree that of course utopia is not one thing to one person, but we did this international polling in 2021 um, from countries as diverse as like Costa Rica and Canada and Sierra Leone and um, Tunisia, and actually there was weirdly like a lot of um, consensus mm -hmm. around what people are angry about. Um, so a lot of concern around divisions in society in a way that I, I, I found really striking um, in places that I didn't expect. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of anger about corruption and um, lack of governments taking action and a lot of anger about the uh, s sense of unfairness in tax systems and who's paying taxes. Um, and on the flip side, there was also a lot of consensus about what people want to see. 
right? So secure housing, it was a big mm. thing that came up because actually most governments are failing on this. Um, and that's, this is kind of the market thing, isn't it, as well, about leaving it to the market to solve and that mm. not happening. There was a lot of consensus around the rich needing to pay more taxes. And there's a lot of consensus around needing access to justice systems. So whilst, yes, utopia can seem, you know, the specifics sometimes can seem different, there is consensus about some key building blocks and it's not rocket science. Um, and that report, if you want to look, it's on the Center on International Corporations website. It's called From Rhetoric to Action. And it kind of spells mm. out this polling data, which was 17,000 people. And it really did, it was quite dramatic in, in how you know, countries you wouldn't necessarily put together at different income levels had a lot of consensus about the change they want to see in the world. So I can see that you want to ask me a question. No, I think I'm just mindful of time because I was told to end on time. So although there's so much to discuss. So um, I'm going to ask all of the people asking questions to keep them brief. So the gentleman there in the purple shirt, and then um, the gentleman here, and then the lady there. Yes, thanks for that. My issue is that... that uh, a three, in terms of protest, frustration, and polarization you mentioned, there is a deadlock of economic mismanagement globally. We have multi-billionaires on the one hand and extreme poverty on the other and inequalities that follow. Despite Georgia's optimism, how or possibly when can this reset of the extreme dysfunction and chaos, is it feasible? Thank you. The ex reset of extreme dysfunction, I think that's a really important mm. question. Um, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, can you hear me? No. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. OK, sorry. My name is Oreste Gallo. I'm an Italian and British citizen. Among other things, I'm a political activist in a political Italian political party, which has been using for decades um, nonviolent um, civic disobedience together with presence in parliament to achieve reforms like divorce, abortion, and other important issues in Italy, as well at the international level with the moratorium of the death penalty at the United Nations. Uh, my question is about, I mean, the current time. I mean, I think that we, we should start again from the thought of uh, Karl Polanyi, as developed then down by Daniel Roderick about the relationship between globalization, uh, democracy, and uh, national sovereignty. Isn't, my question is, isn't the time to really to rethink from the foundation the welfare state? Because we need to respond to all the issues that we are talking about. And I think that the utopia, in, at least in my opinion, is to create a society with, uh, where everybody is able to look in the other people's eyes without any sense of a shame if you are not well-dressed or with a good job. I think that's the lesson from, from the pandemic as well. Thank you. So the question is about the, the, the welfare state and can we, yes. Hello, thank you, very interesting talk. Um, I'm Angel, I work here at LSE. Um, my question, uh, actually it's a bit linked, it's linked to the, what the gentleman was saying. How do we to bring back a sense of society, and our societies are very, as you very rightly say, very polarized, and, uh, um, and you know, we have different experience, and I think for out of capitalism or, you know, individualism, is, uh, everybody wants to protest for their own interest, uh, which are not the same, but how do we bring back a sort of sense that, yes, we're not the same, we might not have the same experience, but we, we want to live together, and, mm. um, so how do we bring back a sense of society? It's kind of what Georgia was saying, how do we create the center that's been lost in the, all this polarization? Um, I think, did I start with Georgia last time? So. <laughs> um, yeah, so the question on economic mismanagement and, and profound dysfunction, is it dysfunction or is it that the way they want it to function, right? And um, I think, so I ran in the 20, 2019 election as well, and here, which was quite, now that I think about it and everything that's happened with Boris Johnson and the way the media supported someone like him, knowing that he was already, you know, been sacked two or three times for being a liar, knowing that he had written racist articles, um, you know, you really saw the strength, the strength of the establishment to act when 
um, they feel that policies potentially are going to hurt the very rich, right? The policies that are going to mean more taxes on the rich and how, how much the establishment pushes back. So, you know, in some ways I'm optimistic, but having seen that, kind of been on the front face in so many media studios and seen how people act and how, how they come together really made me think that, you know, of course, they've made the system to support themselves and to make sure that that privilege and power and wealth is continued to, help, to, to be held at the top. Um, I think that said, I think, and this is why these sorts of topics are so important, the only way we can push back is by right, having some very clear ideas about what needs to happen, to have some very clear social movements, people out on the streets, saying, look, if you don't do these things and we're not going to vote for you or we're not going to you know, support this political system anymore, like politicians need to be more scared of the people than their establishment interests that are constantly um, lobbying them. Um, and I think you know, it is possible. We've seen it happen in other parts of the world. I think, weirdly, you know, with crises um, and continuing crisis in the world in which we're in, it does give us that opportunity to offer these ideas because their ideas that they have are not going to deal with these problems at all. Um, and so we have to be ready to, to come together. We have to be ready with the ideas. We have to be ready to be really critical. Um, and because we don't have some really important pillars of democracy, often not just here, but lots of parts of the world, like the media, um, we need to do that work, which is a lot to ask people when they're you know, working so hard anyway just to make ends meet. Um, but that's the only way I can see it happening. Um, I think on um, the sense of society, the kind of welfare state point as well, you know, we're kind of, it's a contradiction, isn't it? The more we need the welfare state, the more that it's been demonized. Mm. And anyone that is on benefit, so I start the book talking about why I ran against Ian Duncan Smith, who, that some of you may know, he was a conservative minister who really pushed on um, shrinking our welfare state um, mm -hmm. from 2010, put a lot of cruel mm -hmm. reforms in, um, especially for people um, with disabilities, in which my mum was caught in. And it was horrific. It was completely dehumanising. It was a complete um, way in which to treat people with absolutely zero dignity. But alongside those policies were every day in the papers mm -hmm. were talk of benefit cheats mm -hmm. and, the, and this idea of the undeserving poor. So it's a very strong push on the policy and narrative at the same time. And we need to make sure, I think, you know, to some extent, now they've kind of cast that this catch-all term that's been used about being woke, right? And like, oh, you know, it's anything that's like progressive action is like the, just the woke mob, yeah. you know? And so we need to, again, be able to tell our own stories um, and point to that dehumanization. I think one of the things that does give me hope is that as opposed to 2019, and now when I knock on doors, people have realized that they've been lied to much, much more. People are open to having a different mm. conversation. If you don't believe me, come and door knock with me. Um, in Chinkford and Wilfred Green. And that, that gives us an opportunity to kind of press. And I think, again, because of the way in which AI is changing and uh, uh, the systems are changing, we are going to need, we can make that argument for a mm -hmm. welfare state that isn't about just the poorest, is about the middle class as well. And then once you've got that, then it's harder to dehumanize. Um, yeah, and just in terms of bringing people together, I think, you know, as much as possible, it's really important that we mix. So I kind of get into this in the book. Um, about intensive care room at, at, the, at a hospital in the NHS and this mixing across whatever you might vote, whatever your race, mm -hmm. and the very just understanding of the very basics of human empathy. Mm. Like, we all hurt when a loved one dies, and we all, you know, the, just it sounds really cheesy, but it's just those basic things that we have to remember that in most ways we're the same. We care about and we hurt in the same ways about similar, similar things. I mean, that's humanity. Um, and that also needs to be extended to people that are coming from abroad that don't look like us, right? So it's not just Ukrainian refugees, it's refugees of um, all different um, races um, to make sure that we... It, it is really about human empathy and the amount... And that's on all of us to do that work. Absolutely. I think it goes back to George's point about, you know, caring. It doesn't matter if you're voting for whom, you still have those responsibilities. Um, I'm mindful of time, so Georgia, you're going to be the last, you know, your comments, and then I'm going to wrap up the event. Sorry to everyone who I didn't get um, your questions. Okay, so the question of uh, how can we have a sense of society, I was thinking about who is we, 
right? And I think that um, I would like to call in uh, uh, with us Denise Ferreira da Silva, that is a Brazilian sociologist, uh, but she lives in the US. Um, and she has a book that is The Unpayable Debt, um, where she proposed the end of the world as we know it, um, uh, and the destruction of the legal and economic structure that sustains colonialism. And colonialism here is not uh, understand as a moment in space and time, you know, that we learn in history books, but it's really a timeless form that continues in operation and that cares within that raciality, right? And I think that we, uh, this is not a flaw or distortion of the system, but it's a, a political, a symbolic property that structures Western moder modernity itself and how we understand the state and democracy and etc. And I think we really need to put our imagination back, you know, at service of ourselves, of understanding other ways of inhabiting this world. Um, um, that is a potential of like a pluriversal uh, commons that uh, within coloniality that is structurally, structurally committed to eliminate difference. Um, you know, the, the cis heteropatriarchal, you know, white Europeans, uh, I mean, as a, as a symbolism, right? Not, uh, I'm saying you or as a person, but what it symbolizes, you know, the raciality of the, you know, uh, the Western state. I think, I think we shouldn't be, you know, um, putting that on the side. It's at the center of this dispute. Also at the ruining, it, the ruining itself of, you know, the, so-called, uh, you know, welfare state. So I think that um, if the coloniality, uh, the economics of coloniality is a, a, of a total violence and a permanent expropriation of bodies and uh, land and labor and dehumanization of a big, you know, um, part of the population, right? As non-humans that don't deserve to live. Um, you know, uh, how can we then offer, you know, what, where we should we be looking at to find, you know, the commons in the community, right? You know, why is evangelic church rising so much? You know, people want to be together, right? Everybody needs to belong to belong. So how can we create the commons and communities, you know, um, and, and exercise our interdependence? So I think this is where we should be looking. And then at maybe, in this way, we can go back to understand who is we when we speak about we. Thank you, Georgia. I think that's a really good way of ending here. Apologies again to those who I couldn't get to your questions. I want to thank Faiza and Georgia for such a fascinating discussion, which I hope you all enjoyed. For the in-person attendees, um, the stewards will have copies of Georgia's report, Commons Now, Latin American Spells, for collection action, which you can um, collect. And you will also have an opportunity to purchase co a copy of Faiza's new book, Know Your Place, which you will be signing, right? Okay. <laughs> and there are lots of exciting events happening later today at the LSE Festival. So please do take a copy of the program if you haven't gotten one already. Um, since I am based at the International Inequalities Institute, I will give a shout out for a couple of our events. One is um, This Is Not America, Why Black Lives in Britain Matter, which is taking place at 12.30, so shortly after this event. And um, What Would a Fairer Society Look Like, which is happening this evening at 6. So please, if you would join me in thanking both of our speakers.